in part two because we talked about this a little bit at um, last summer's meeting. Um, this picture shows Goat Flat, which is the alpine tundra up in the Pintler Mountains in southwestern Montana. And I've been studying plant species and functional trait distribution there for a while and also at Glacier National Park, but we have soil temperatures buried there and data is not all that easy to extract from this site because you can't really get there until late summer. So next slide, please. All right, so the link, be a link between alpine plant ecology and environmental sensing. So one, plant functional traits vary with position on paraglacial pattern ground and near snowfields in the alpine tundra. And paraglacial pattern ground provides a mosaic of microhabitats. And what you see here, um, this picture shows James and Kevin and two of Kevin's dogs. Um, they're standing on polygons of the pattern ground. And so it occurs um, in stripes as well as polygons up here at Goat Flat. And so environmental sensing links plant functional traits with environmental signals and FLIR forward looking infrared images detect temperatures of plants and of pattern ground and snow fields. And five, we installed an array of soil temperature sensors, but can only retrieve data at the sites. And the six, our alpine tundra sites are in the wilderness, have harsh winters, and are accessible only in late summer. For example, we haven't gone up there yet. It's probably going to be another two to three weeks until it opens up. Um, seven, research should be scaled up with wilderness-ready soil moisture sensors and with remote and year-round access. And the second half of this talk is going to be James Gallagher talking about how we're working on um, getting more access to data and developing soil moisture sensors. Next. So here's what we've got going so far. At Goat Flat in the Pintler Mountains in southwestern Montana, it's a, almost 3,000 meters, but not quite. Um, we surveyed the distribution of plant species and functional traits, and we installed an array of onset hobo tidbits temperature sensors at four sites. And these are buried in the soil, which is important there because it's a wilderness area and you can't really leave stuff lying around. Um, it'll get destroyed. It destroys the, it hampers the wilderness ethos and there are many wild creatures up there. So we have 18 sensors in the center of the polygons or brown stripes and 18 on the edge of polygons or on green stripes. And we found that in the brown centers of polygons, plants are very different. They tend to be have rhizomes, tap roots, xeromorphic, which means drought tolerant. They're usually herbaceous, just small plants. Um, on the green edges of polygons, we have herbaceous plants too, but we have dwarf shrubs, and coniferous tree seedlings and um, little trees come in there and get their starts on these edges between the polygons. Okay, next. Oh, and that, sorry, sorry, oops. Those little orange things are the sensors um, where we have them. And here's, here's some data from, oh, next please, sorry. Here's some data from last year where we have the center of the polygon, which is the brown part, which has the plants that are more drought tolerant, having higher temperatures for the most part, not always, a greater amplitude of temperatures and um, not as much um, snow cover in the late spring, which is what you see where there's that little plat green line that plateaus. So this is, to the far left is summer, and to the far right is the next summer. So we've got some temperature differences. Okay, next. So these are FLIR pictures, and this is on a, this is my list of, on my list of what I want to do this summer. Um, when, the tra when the trail opens up, I'm gonna take my little FLIR 1 camera, which fits on my phone, up to the site 
and measure plants. And you get these images and you can um, then use an app called FLIR Tools and you can take spot measurements and circle measurements of um, individual plants or of groups of plants, say within an area or a quadrat. And this is just a sample picture and shows a red tulip and the inside of the tulip is hotter than the inside of the upper petals of the tulip, which is where it's dark blue. Next. Okay, so then um, this past year I've been on sabbatical and um, one of the things I've done is to go down to the South Island of New Zealand to the University of Otago. And while there, I went up to the Gloria site, which is a, a climate change and plant study network. And they have tussocks, which are these large mound hobbity looking grasses. And with fl the FLIR one, I could see, or FLIR one, I could see that the tussocks are cooler than the surroundings. So a tussock is a large grass. And then this works with landforms and patterns as well. In the lower right, you can see where it says Pacific Ocean Beach Sand, true hardship. I had to take this FLIR one camera down to the um, Pacific Ocean Beach on the south end of the South Island and take a picture. And you could see with sand ripples that there were differences in temperature. So I'm hoping we can get some images of the polygons and stripes and see if there are temperature differences showing up in the images. Okay, next. All right. And now I'm going to turn it over to James Gallagher. <clears throat> okay, um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, okay, so uh, rationale. So the alpine tundra is a relatively harsh environment. And so we want to develop um, sensors that can not only survive in this environment, but also will be able to broadcast the information that they are sensing in more or less real time so that we can access that information without having to go to these locations. Um, there are a number of reasons why you would want to do that. Um, I'm not going to go into all of those right now. I think uh, we probably all know, but suffice to say that being able to access them throughout the year means that that we can avoid a lot of problems that um, develop with things that can only be accessed, say, once every three or four years. Next slide. Uh, you only have two minutes left. Right. So um, we've been working on using LoRa to develop a, a sensor network. And in particular, we've been working on a kind of a mesh network concept. Next, and this is a, this is a frequency plot of a LoRa device broadcasting information. Next slide, please. So um, this isn't quite the right slide stack, but one of the things that we've done over the series over a while is we've modified our design quite a bit. We've dropped using or attempting to use the cell phone network as a principal mechanism for internet connection and replaced that with a rock block uh, modem, which works with the Iridium satellite system. In addition, we've replaced our star node network concept with one based on mesh networking, where all of the end nodes will broadcast and all of the end nodes will also receive and store. And then final modification to our underlying uh, concept of nodes and the networking scheme is to employ a sort of vast storage potential that we can get with SD cards so that all of those nodes, nodes will be able to store all of the other nodes information. Since we can get eight or 16 gigabytes of storage on these tiny machines, um, we should try to leverage that as much as possible and use that uh, to mitigate the risk that the low raw may not function all the time. Next slide. Um, these are some students that worked on uh, a, a summer or a student research project 
to develop an early prototype of the rock block based uh, master or central node. Um, we have since moved on to another design developed by yet another student. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is a close up of what the device looks like. Um, it's largely based on Arduinos, although we have moved on from the Arduino Uno and we're now using the Rocket Scream chips, uh, the Rocket Scream boards, which are based on the uh, ARM Cortex M0 processor. So we've upped the ante in processing power significantly with that change. The cost is essentially the same. Next slide. And this is a picture of an early prototype end node. Um, it is based on a really cheap Arduino Pro Mini. Um, and the end nodes will probably actually move to the rocket stream as well. Again, part of our notion is to stop trying to use the lowest price components in the initial development. And we'll focus on reducing price once we have prototypes that can function properly. Next slide, please. Uh, well, that's pretty much it. And I think we've come in at under time. Um, in another slide stack, we have some really awesome pictures of the low rod transmitting over 300 and 400 foot distances and through some dirt obstacles. And just to provide a little bit more information, we're seeing signal levels in the minus 120 dBm um, range, which is about what you can expect from rocket, from low rod rather. Um, so. One other thing is that we have a related poster. Our, our summer student, um, Jameson Ellers, is a summer undergraduate research student, and he's um, made a poster on his work, and he has um, made 3D printed boxes for this, so they're ruggedized for being able to be in the out of doors. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, well, Renee is bringing the next one up. Thank you. Virtually uh, join me in, in thanking uh, thank uh, Martha and James nice, there. Yeah. This is great. Good job. Yeah. Uh, minus 120 DPM is good. So um, it is. It is. We tested it out the other day. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Nice. So we're going to follow up with discussion and questions uh, during the, we're going to do a uh, mid session facilitated group discussion. Um, and so we're going to move right into our next presenter. And I think, Renee, you've got it ready to go. So uh, Joseph yeah. from USGS. And just a couple things. So I cannot, I do not have access to any of my Zoom controls when I'm screen sharing. So I'd like to mute um, and I would, Scotty, can I have you do the timekeeping? Yeah, I'm watching the time. So I'll, I'll, and, I'll keep an eye okay. on that and then I'll give the two minute warning. Okay, yeah, and then I see we have some new people in. Um, so please feel free to use a Zoom chat for Q and A. Um, the, the session uh, presenters can can respond to that um, in the chat here, and yeah, so exactly. So I'm going to mute and share screen for Joseph. Great, uh, fantastic! You all should be able to hear me. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak in the session. Um, I I have a picture over my shoulder. And, you know, that's the, it's funny to have that opportunity when I was flying out to ESIP last year in Tacoma, and it's hard to believe it's been less than a year between summer meetings. So uh, fantastic. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yes, I'm Joseph Bell from USGS out of Baltimore, and I'm here to speak about um, a question to Renee. Are you sharing my screen to everyone? Because I just see you. I don't see my slides. Yep. Start the share. Sorry about that. No, you're good. You're good. It's intro, intro slide. So I'm out of Baltimore and I've been fortunate enough to connect with a group that's um, looking at the next generation of water observing systems in the USGS. I was um, really stoked, still am, caught up with the session uh, in ESIP and, and the session last year in Tacoma in the ESIP meeting, summer meeting last year. It's such a fantastic experience. Um, Renee and Scotty have helped me grow professionally. So it's a really fantastic shout out to, to this cluster. So um, you're on the second slide now. And what we're looking at is a really noisy slide that um, you folks should have had um, me take care of you a little bit better. But uh, this is a go at really putting together what the survey is and what it is looking at, right? So, you know, we have this great ability and excuse me, I have, my chat board is hugging my face now. All right, so thank you. USGS has this great and, and challenging transition coming up, right? We have a lot of laggard and, and retrofits into the system as, as well as new things coming in, right? We're talking about license 
band radio frequencies, LoRa, um, you know, the LP1 aspects of things. So we have a lot of things coming together, and that means we do have a lot of baggage, right? So uh, you know what I have down there in the anchor on the on the left screen is you know this isn't a knock, but it's a it's a cartoon at um, you know what we really have to to go through in the survey to um, kind of move the base level up, if you will, to, to, to the next level of um, functionality and, um, you know, observing systems power. So we have things like, you know, the SDI-12, right? But we also have analogs and some folks somewhere in the surface water division at one point in time had a computer that couldn't hook up to the internet because a firmware update would break their connection connection to an instrument. So you know, there are these, these small circumstances where we have these um, legacy retrofits that we're dragging behind. And um, in one of the ways that we're looking at a creative solution to this um, are, you know, some of the possibilities that the next gen program is affording us. And so this next gen program has a research and development component to it. And that's the, the part that's really driving this research. So uh, what we're looking at are programmable gateways, right? So this is different than a logger, right? We're looking at programmable gateways so that we can really control the communication. We've worked so hard for so long to control the scripting and the, and, and the prescribed algorithms for monitoring. We're now working into that, looking into that field of how can we do this with communications and um, lower costs of O&M as well as improve the quality of monitoring. Um, one of the things that is really exciting is an ability to wrap SDI-12 observations in a LoRa um, protocol, if you will. Um, so uh, we're going to cover that next. Renee, next slide. Right. So, you know, what we're looking at and what we need is a scalable solution, right? So I mentioned this aspect of um, wrapping SDI-12 and um, and then also the, the aspect that this has to work in an urban setting and then it also has to work in these um, rugged environmental settings out west, right? So what we are looking at doing is a module approach, right? So we're going to test these units, right? We're going to test a gateway. We're going to test these wireless sensors as a module. So instead of coming in to, you're looking at the top picture, right? What would resemble a USGS super gauge, right? I really like that name. The, 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 the groups that stand them up are proud of seeing 20 data descriptors on the internet, right? So we call these super gauges, right? And one of these is being stood up in the uh, Philadelphia area around the Independence Seaport Museum by the Ben Franklin Bridge. That's the top right corner. And this is an area where we're working with both indoor and outdoor data. We're connected with the museum. So there's a huge public outreach there. And this is where we want to test something like the um, multi-tech gateway or even the layered gateways, right? For their programmability, right? Can we get these to respond to messages two-way communications, just had a great conversation that showed that's possible. So, the, you know, we are, we're heading down this path and, and when we get to a site like this, so when we get to a site in the urban setting or in, in the most remote settings, we don't want to come in and hook into the folks' infrastructure because that's just enormously disrupting and the possibility of uh, causing damage to their workflow is too great. So we're looking at a module approach, right? So we'll come in, we'll set up in parallel, and then we'll look to do things like scrape data, right? If we can scrape data from the web, or if we can scrape data from our own databases, then we know that we can solidly essentially take this module and flip the switch to go time, right? So we're looking at this, this approach to uh, independent in parallel testing that can basically take over. So when we complete the testing, if there's something that is a large scale upgrade across the survey monitoring, we're set to implement that. Or maybe perhaps it's one single piece of equipment that needs to be changed in a specific um, workflow, right? We're also looking at that. And that's the scalability component. Um, and, you know, the other thing too is when we look at the remote sections, so I'm going to bring in the SDI-12 component here. When we look at these remote deployments in the survey, it's and even just the simple predominant um, go-to protocol for sampling collection in the survey is SDI-12. We have to handle this. And one of, the, one of the exciting technologies out there that we're coming across from a group called Riot, um, Radio Internet of Things, is an ability to wrap SDI-12. So basically what they have created is a hat that sits on top of an SDI-12 sensor and then a receiver, which would get, hook into a data logger. So the data logger would ping that receiver as if it were an a SDI-12 unit. That receiver would send that SDI-12 command wrapped in LoRa the hat on top of the SDI-12 probe would um, basically translate it backwards into SDI-12, call for the observation, reverse the 
process and send it back. This is a retrofit that we feel has a lot of value added. So it's something else that we're going to be testing uh, coming up. Next slide, Renee. And just to, just to finish it up, right, um, all right, what, what's next? So what's next is we are finally ready to move. Um, I chuckled to myself when I saw the, the, the low raw, um 915 megahertz screen because I, I just finished a test uh, recently that failed quickly because they sent the Euro unit, right? The 868 megahertz. So um, we ordered a gateway and it came from, it came loaded with the Euro channel. So we have to send that back. So it's gonna delay things a little bit. But um, right here is where I'm gonna send a shout out to David Coyle. Uh, he is uh, also works with the USGS out in Reston, an IT guy. And David is, man, he's a rock star with this stuff and he's really helped me through it. So thanks a lot, David. I look forward to working with you on this project uh, and then possibly uh, reporting back to the cluster uh, in a more in-depth session. There's one more slide, Renee, right? Yes. And then this is just a, a go at putting data to work and, and leveraging those partnerships, right? We, we are in communication with these manufacturers now than we've ever been before. And importantly, we're in communication with um, like Martha Apple, right? We, we just heard from, from those folks. And it's, it's so great to be in this position because I get to relay to the manufacturers the, the needs of the mess on the right, all of this stuff in the USGS. But then I also get to relay these needs of, man, I need this tiny temp temperature probe that can handle the roughest of, of places. And this is a go at something like that. Uh, uh, this is a go at providing um, communications where you need it uh, from the company in situ, right? You're supposed to push a button and it's going to connect with any in situ sensor, and then you can leave it there. It connects to uh, different types of backhauls, right? So it'll do cell. It's the the production model will do LoRa. It can also do satellites and Wi-Fi. So um, really cool. We're looking forward to testing this out and running it through the paces. And, and again, hopefully we can report back to this group with that. Um, I don't know where I am with my time because yeah, you're at two minutes right now. That's great. And I'll, I'll leave that time for questions later. Uh, really, this is just an intro session on where we're going in the short, short, immediate future. Excellent. Thank you, Joseph. I, everyone, please virtually uh, thank Joseph for his talk. We're going to transition into our facilitated group discussion next. And I'll bet based on those two presentations and the, the synergies involved that there's probably going to be some, some questions and topics raised. So we'll use the chat. Um, we can also uh, use audio. I would say um, there's, there's some Zoom controls to allow hand raising and that sort of thing. We do have 38 participants on the line, so it might be difficult to just open this up for free form discussion. We'll see how, uh, how, how much folks wanna talk, but uh, either raise your hand in the chat or raise your hand uh, up here and uh, we can go to you if you have questions for the speakers or for Renee and I or topics would like to raise for the cluster in general uh, as we look at uh, the next year and setting up uh, potential virtual workshops um, and things like that. We're going to have three more speakers um, starting 15 minutes from now. So if you go away, don't go far uh, because those are also gonna be very interesting including um, onboard uh, very lightweight edge computation and, um, and other topics. Looking for hands being raised. I'm not seeing anything. Renee, did you did you have anything you wanted to comment on or ask questions about there? Uh, both these presentations have been great. Um, I do have a question. I I guess I'll ask it since nobody else is asking a question. Um, James and and maybe Joseph too. Have either of you guys had experience um, using 12 volt power for your Arduino devices? Um, <clears throat> I have not had any experience with that, actually. I've gone the other way. Um, you know, the base Arduino comes out in a five volt version, but I dropped right away to 3.3 because the various lithium chemistry batteries produce 3.7, 3.3 around in there. And so you can just pop those batteries in and run your devices from those. And there's some pretty interesting battery chemistries out there. So Kevin um, and the student at MTech discovered these lithium thionyl chloride batteries, and they supposedly work to minus 65 C. So that's what we're gonna go with. We switched over. Um, 
But as far as higher voltages, you just need a voltage regulator and you just try to shoot for something that's reasonably efficient, you know? Cool, thanks. Uh, yeah, that's that's the approach. Um, I have a student working on, on some stuff here in New Mexico and we have access to 12 volt at the site. Um, double A's are just taken, he's just running through double A's very quickly, so. Uh -huh. Um, but we encountered some issues with 12 volt. I might talk to you more offline about it. Okay, cool. I'm gonna offer, uh, there's a really nice step up, uh, 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 a set of step up regulators that also regulate down to the desired voltage. Um, and I can uh, send a link to that right after uh, right after my talk. All right. Oh, that'd be cool too, yeah. They're very, very cheap. Well, they're $5, but they uh, go both directions. So you can drain a lithium battery to its end. Yeah, and I would love to see more information on testing of various step ups and downs. It's been my experience that voltage regulators are really sensitive to um, sort of near miss lightning strikes. So electrical, mm. electrical transients and in these environments, particularly where Martha is talking about deploying, maybe not everywhere Joseph's talking about deploying, but nonetheless, um, I've had a lot of step ups and downs get smoked when loggers have been fine, radios have been fine, other things have been fine. And I think it's just due to sensitive yeah. semiconductor design. Yeah, we've had an, an earlier project. Um, we had some sensors taken out by lightning. So yeah. Looks like we have a question in the chat for both speakers. For low cost sensors, how do you validate the observations? And I'm assuming that this is more in the um, engineering validation uh, maybe to do with uh, you know the the engineering uh, error bars to do with particular uh, instrument perhaps that's I'm guessing yes so speaking that's correct oh, oh. <laughs> but as a non-engineer I'll, I'll speak to what I do ecologically is that I have some higher cost sensors in there and I can compare data from lower cost with higher cost sensors and see where we are. But engineer, what do you think? Um, well, actually I have sort of ignored that question. So why don't we ping that over to Joseph? Okay. <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, so what, what we do in the survey is uh, typically we have this extensive calibration process and we track it. And now we're talking about using instruments of, um, you know, it's important to note too, I was gonna start off you know, low cost doesn't indicate low quality, right? So, you know, that's, that's important too, right? So when we're talking about low cost sensors, I'm automatically going to a point that, you know, this is going to function um, for the most part as, as you expect it to, right? You're, it's not gonna last a couple of days and burn out or something like that, right? So, you know, when it comes down to it, you have to ask yourself, what are you collecting the data for? And this is what the survey is doing right now. If we're collecting data, to the uh, hundreds do we need to be, right? What is the data and how does it fit the model? So that's the approach we're taking um, for uh, in, at least in the next generation water observation testing uh, viewpoint. And the idea behind that is to calibrate to that meter's accuracy, right? Um, we're, we're not looking to, in the survey, we're not looking to replace everything with uh, something else and then deal with the calibrations there. We're looking to augment, right? So, you know, this fit for purpose monitoring, how do we specifically, how do we do it? We check it against standard before and after, and, and then um, as we go out to field sites, one of the awesome things that we're looking at with these programmable gateways is an ability to do a virtual field inspection, right? How, is there a way that a camera that's looking at optics can send a message to the gateway that says, my optics are fouling. So let's start this field regime where the, the gateway now sends a message to a manifold that gets injected with water and it blows the, the fouling off the optics. And then um, that sends back a message that says generate a, a file for the Aquarius time series data, right? And then that can go into uh, as a virtual inspection. So the question of the, you know, how do we calibrate or how do we check the standards? Um, we first understand what the purpose of the instrument is for and then calibrate it accordingly. Uh, we may also set up a surrogate where we know the apps, we, we have the known and we look to see how it behaves. Hopefully that answers the question. All right. We have another question in the chat for Joseph. Uh, rain and snow fade, signal fade um, with Laura, I bet. I, I can't speak to that yet. Uh, so that, that's why this was a teaser. Um, 
one of the things that we are expecting to test is just that, right? How do these, how do the distances pair up through um, these different environmental uh, signatures? And that's part of the test, right? We have that that section that we chose near of uh, the Delaware River near Philly is uh, we're hoping to connect down into the Delaware Bay as well as up into the upper parts of the watershed for that reason, right? What, what does it look like when there's heavy rain bands in the Delaware Bay and it's clear in Philly? Okay, um, I guess I wanna hear just a little bit more about that minus 20 dBm um, signal measurement from, uh, from Martha and, and James there. Oh yeah, okay. so this is what we did. We have, we have enough area in our backyard to set up a mini sort of quasi sensor network. So we set up um, three nodes, a receiver, well actually four nodes, a receiver and three um, transmitting nodes. And we had them set um, with typical low raw uh, parameters, a spreading factor of seven and a coding rate of one. And, um, and we sent these packets and the packets were about 50 or 60 bytes. And, um, and we experimented with the receiver, the sensors were on the ground. The receiver was both above the ground, about four meters and also on the ground. And we compared the received signal strengths. Um, when the sensor was on the ground because of a bench that it forms in the land, the, there was actually a, a earthen uh, obstruction between the transmitting nodes and the receiving node. And so we saw a spread of uh, received signal strengths from minus 95 decibels with a straight line to minus 120 decibels from the farthest location with the earthen obstruction. Um, again, we were sending these 50, uh, like 53 byte packets. That means there's a total of like 90 bytes or so in the entire frame. And uh, the time, I'm, I'm trying to remember these numbers off the top of my head, they're in the other slides, but the time on air was about 150 milliseconds. Um, so anyways, so, so we, were, we were able to, we, we can compute the received signal strength from the receiver. And I'm assuming that the receiver's RSSI is in DBM and it's reasonably accurate. It, it, these seem like values that you would expect. Um, and we looked at the received signal strength using a software defined radio, which is what that little spectrum picture came from. Um, so not a terribly sophisticated uh, piece of test equipment, but good enough. Um, the, the nodes were about three or 400 feet apart and the transmission strength was set at 13 dBm. And these particular boards can go to 23. So that's about, and they go from five to 23. So that's about half their power. So we could have probably gotten more distance at that power level. Um, at that power level, we were about, we were at minus nine dB signal to noise ratio. So the signal is actually below the noise floor by a fairly significant amount. And, and I've got that in, we, we got, we captured fairly large amounts of textual data for the various pieces of information. So we can go over it later on if you want to. Got it. Okay, well, we have just a few minutes left in our discussion time. There was one more uh, question, and Joe, you could probably answer this in the chat. Um, the measurements that you're making in the next gen observation system, what are the different parameter environmental um, parameters that you're measuring? And maybe just list a few in the chat, I think. Uh, Renee and I wanted to hit one more topic uh, before we move on, and that is we've talked about doing hands on workshops in ESIP meetings on these technical topics um, that we're speaking about here today and what we talked about in the cluster over the last couple of years. Well, this year threw us a curveball, and so we can't do an in-person meeting and therefore a hands-on workshop might be fairly difficult. We're batting around if, let's say in the winter, for the winter meeting in January, that if we're still not able to meet in person, um, should we attempt uh, a virtual workshop or should we do it during some other time in the year um, where we attempt to do a little bit of hands-on and, and I'd like to one gauge interest and two have those of you that do tinker on hardware uh, think about this just a little bit um, and maybe get back to Renee and I 
uh, offline about whether or not you'd be interested in doing a, just a small piece, a small module, maybe you know a couple of steps or a hands-on introduction um, and think about how we might do that. So depending on the technology, folks may or may not be able to have it on hand or acquire it, but is that something that you could actually walk through you know, with the camera on your workbench or something along those lines where you just kind of go through the steps and people can go through it with you. So let's, let's talk about that. I get uh, Mike Daniel says that the winter meeting will be virtual. So inside baseball from the ESIP board. So there we go. Um, so, so think about the virtual workshop idea and um, that some of these mechanistic, mechanistic ways in which we can do it, which again could mean pointing your camera at your screwdrivers and, and, and test meters and these sorts of things, um, and, and think about the value that might be there. And, and I don't mean we try to make it formal like it could be a taped tutorial later perhaps, but more of just a, a workshop where we're, we're conversing in real time and, and someone is walking us through a particular piece of tech. So, Renee, I think, is that what you had in mind uh, for that part of the discussion? Then? Yeah, um, there's there's been, I think, a lot of interest recently in in this topic. And, and I know from um, previous telecons, recent ones, like Andrew, Andrew Reddick's uh, presentation on Internet of Things, um, he has had reached out to um, Scotty and me about doing uh, some sort of IOT workshop, um, but was looking for funding to hold that. And so that's something else that we probably need some assistance with if, if we're not going to do it under um, ESIP. Um, how are we going to get the equipment to the participants of these workshops? Um, you know, and I uh, teach a, a sensor workshop at Savieta. I've been doing it for a long time, couldn't do it this year because of COVID. Um, Mark Gaylor, who's on this call, is doing one at North Temperate Lakes. Um, he is likely going to cancel his uh, later this year. And so, um, you know, there is already some workshops for these higher cost research grade sensing um, technologies. Um, it would be tough maybe to do those workshops virtually, but with this lower cost technology, um, I think there's a need for it, especially right now. People are stuck at home uh, looking for something to do. We have a lot of expertise in this group, um, a lot of people who could potentially take on instructing some part of this. So, um, yeah, we just want to gauge interest. Yep, we'd be happy to, if it's an idea where you would like to teach a piece that would involve a small kit that wouldn't be, you know, hundreds of dollars, it would be less uh, per, per iteration. Um, and we thought maybe we, if we wanted to actually create an organized virtual workshop where we would spec the kits in advance, we would seek um, external funding if people weren't able to um, fund the kits themselves. And we have some ideas about how to do that, again, if it's inexpensive. Um, through our various projects, and then um, have a, a little curriculum, and then send these things out, and then have a, a way to to interact over video, um, could be could be real valuable. So keep that in mind, um, and again, get back to us if you are interested in um, leading a, a module or a small piece or a large piece yeah. of something like that. You know, I definitely think that can happen. It's sort of a lab fee and a, just a tiny, you know, 50 bucks worth of parts. You can actually get some things to work. Yeah, no, I, I- Software is open source. We all have computers more or less with USB ports. That's really all you need. Yeah. Good, we've used That's up our discussion time. My presentation actually. <laughs> Here we go. So Renee, yeah. do you want to queue up the next, uh, next presentation there? So now, um, we'll go, so we, we were successfully able to break up our, uh, our hour and a half long session with some one-on-one -on -one interaction or one-on-many, -on -many, which is great, um, many-on-many. -many. And now uh, we're gonna go back into presentation mode and we have three more talks for you. Uh, the first one is gonna be Daniel Fuca and he is gonna talk about uh, TensorFlow AI on very inexpensive microcontrollers. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, this talk, and hopefully the rest of you are as well. Uh, Renee is sharing the intro screen, so I'm going to just start the timer when you're ready. Daniel, take it away. All right. 
And uh, I, I have to admit that this is the very first time that I have uh, presented something in which it was all people from one institution. So if you like what you see here, or if it intrigues you, please join on because it's a very uncomfortable uh, situation presenting one institution. Next slide. Uh, so uh, a quick overview, uh, why, machine, uh, why I'm actually getting stuck in, uh, dealing with machine learning and AI based edge processing, what, uh, why it's necessary for my uh, my workbench over here. Uh, demonstrate that my serious research really is a joke. The, the, some of the use cases that we're working on. And uh, I want to get you started in 10 minutes and under $30. I have a, uh, it's, it's actually very expensive. Uh, James can, uh, can uh, back me up that I've never actually suggested a $30 device, but uh, something that expensive. But I'm going to get you, uh, I'm going to uh, get you started there. And then uh, just a couple of thoughts for discussion, since uh, I think this is the first time we've discussed AI in this group. Next slide. Uh, so why is uh, machine learning AI based edge processing necessary? We've really come to a situation where uh, these sensors, we have amazing sensors, uh, but uh, 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 the sensors are now significantly less you can put together a sensing package for significantly less than the cost of one month of data transport through say cellular or satellite feeds so we've been working on that within this group and it's very exciting uh, uh, with the laura work that uh, we have all been doing uh, but once again laura is a very low bandwidth uh, solution but when we're looking at sound, I, I have one project right here uh, up in the upper right hand corner, uh, looking at ut utilizing the Artemis with the mic uh, microphone for um, uh, invasive mosquito and frog I identification, species and gender. We can't send an entire megabit stream over LoRa, but what we need is that, that cheap sensor, $10 sensor to be thrown out in many random places. Same thing over uh, as we go uh, counterclockwise, uh, animal behaviors, uh, once again, happiness and pooping and the habits of, a, of an animal. Uh, we're, we're using LoRa for our current network at the ag research farms, but it's a megabit of data and that is expensive. Uh, I'm starting to get into video with $10 field cameras and oddly enough, spectrometers uh, and these data we want to send 20 kilometers and our only options uh, for getting it out from where we're working is LoRa and satellite. So uh, uh, video becomes a whole lot, 35 megabits to 54 megabits of data. One thing I want to uh, call out on the cheap side, if you guys go to a gas station, go look for the those are. You can get these really nice, really small batteries, 3.7 volt for either free or a dollar at most. So you know, take advantage of the vaping, you know, the vapors out there. Uh, on the left-hand side, this is not, uh, I'm actually uh, trying to get many soil samples characterized quickly. And so this is actually a BLE solution in which we're doing uh, you know, building a $6 soil texture uh, analysis. It's actually just a tipping light, uh, 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 tip, uh, tipping density meter. Uh, next slide. Uh, so how did we start? Uh, I got to give credit to where our very little bit of funding for this actually came from. And that is uh, the administration at our university said, really, they like people working across uh, boundaries. So we're going to stick hydrologists, anima, uh, animal scientists, double E's, into a room and, and give them a farm and say, what can you do for nearly nothing? And uh, no, no, we've come up with some impressive stuff. Uh, basically what we have is up in the upper left-hand corner, you can, uh, there's actually a weather station that we can uh, corroborate with. The question in the last uh, presentation was, how do you corroborate cheap sensors? And we'll go into that a little bit uh, later. Uh, we also have areas that animals are hanging out, eating over in the low, lower right-hand corner. Uh, just keep those uh, the red and the green corners uh, memorized in your head because we'll uh, show you a map of, a of what our low network is doing. Next slide. 
Uh, so what we did come up with, what, uh, what I ended up building, and actually James participated in this a little bit, um, uh, uh, was uh, basically what I call my $25 multi-science station. And this is old uh, no, from, uh, from last year. But uh, no, what we found was these go together fairly nicely, fairly easily. Um, there's actually much better solutions right now for right around that price that you can buy off the shelf. And what we were able to do was in the lower left hand corner, you can see uh, there is a, weather, a, a fairly nice uh, $45,000 weather station sitting there. And on it is my, uh, um, my little uh, hack at a uh, remote LoRa based uh, weather station, basically just shoving everything here into there and then adding in some uh, kind of uh, uh, um, uh, some soil moisture probes. We can also stick this next to a stream, similar probes that uh, easily to build and you have a, uh, you can get stream flow along with all the other weather metrics. Uh, these also have a GPS on them and um, uh, that's one of the things I won't let go of. I put a GPS on everything because GPSs give you uh, a really nice analysis of, uh, of the atmospheric profile. So it's, uh, it's something, it's a paper I've been wanting to read, uh, write for a long time, but we can also take this weather station expanded out and strap it onto a horse, uh, a horse's head and find out where does the horse like eating and uh, where it's happy. And we can also put it, uh, strap it on its tail and a tail wrap and lo and hold, behold, we'll be able to tell where, uh, where we can tell where the horse is defecating. Next slide. So uh, the, final, uh, the, the final part of this study was actually just evaluating the research farm, evaluating LoRa for transport, uh, throwing in uh, uh, sensors both on the uh, fixed uh, meteorological station as well as on uh, uh, some of the animals out there and let them run around. We drove them around in the field to get uh, our RSSI's uh, 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 mapped to, to see can we do this one kilometer by one kilometer? It's actually a five kilometer by five kilometer space with a single radio or what is the density of receivers that we're gonna need. So it came out good. And I want to just say, you can learn more about this project. If you look up Ruth Durr in her data conservation in, act, in action, she'll be presenting uh, data, uh, this data set a little bit more thoroughly uh, in her project on Thursday. Next slide. Uh, so, but the, actually, sorry, that's not supposed to be the sensors. It's just, but sensors produce a lot more data. And these are shock sensors, gyroscopes and such. And lo and behold, they produce way too much data. And we need all that data to define whether the, uh, no, no, whether they're defecating. So uh, what we want to look at is, is the data normal or is it not normal? And both of those are, are uh, the, the not normal is actually very interesting because we can activate our little cameras, field cameras uh, when, uh, when something is not normal. Next slide. Two minutes. Okay, one last, uh, no, no, one last use case in Hawaii where uh, there's invasive species that are going and killing. I'm putting in the most depressing picture in ESIP, uh, but they're killing the invasive species. Uh, 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 are, sorry, they're killing the uh, native Hawaiian birds. And so we're actually looking at throwing these little sensors out into the field to try to map where, you know, where, the, uh, uh, where these invasive species are. And we can actually tell the differences between them by, the, uh, uh, by their sound signatures. This is something that AI is very good for because it's basically the same as a yes or no command to a microcontroller. Next. So 10 minute expert, basically this is that $30 device uh, if you have not started in, in any of this yet, uh, just get this device. It's much more expensive than I would have normally done, uh, would normally recommend, but it gets you all the way from never actually programming an Arduino device to actually doing AI on it uh, with every sensor that we have talked about in this group, almost every sensor that we've talked about this group. It's tensor-like and compatible nine axis inertial sensor, humidity, temperature, pressure, uh, microphone, uh, gesture uh, uh, and proximity has the accelerometers on there and uh, light and intensity sensor going on to the next. Uh, and I'm just gonna say, once you get that, don't, don't follow anyone else's instructions, 
keep this in mind, Arduino TensorFlow Lite tutorial. And this is something I'll build, uh, that I'll build on for a workshop that I'm recommending or, or that, uh, that I'm volunteering. And they start you literally at uh, this, with this one, with this board, if you have never actually touched an Arduino device before. The very first step is getting your Arduino programming IDE. Next. And basically, a hint as to what uh, what that was going uh, uh, what I was going to present, but uh, was a part of that workshop. But uh, what would uh, what I'd like to do is to step up from that uh, from uh, uh, that and go into how to add additional sensors and additional characteristics to uh, the machine learning uh, 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 examples that they have. So in this case, uh, getting uh, since I don't have horse uh, the, the sit stand. Uh, uh, commands uh, uh, for the dog and being able to determine are they sitting and standing. The next thing would be a poop is very similar to that, but uh, 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 and being able to recognize that and map uh, map as to where it's happening. So this is that thirty dollar device BLE uh, and uh, uh, goes right into the AI. And last slide, I think. Uh, it's the final thoughts. These are the questions that we wanted to pose. For later and that is uh yeah things that are pretty easy actually this makes edge processing really easy uh, uh, tensorflow light uh, in that example and you're an expert uh, at least at the microcontroller level uh laura uh, i think that we're getting pretty mature on laura uh, but things that are still hard are some of the questions that we've had power one of the things that i'm struggling with is ble to a public database uh at at high frequencies and semantics and ontologies, which will be covered on Thursday. And I think we're done. Next slide. And thank you. Thank my dog Barks for posing. Thank the corn in the background. All right, thank you, Daniel. Everyone join me. Thank you virtually, uh, Daniel, for your talk. Um, you, I think you posed a lot of interesting questions for this group, That so that fits right into um, everything that we're touching today. And uh, I think there's some workshop potentials um, with, with that for sure. Folks, hold your questions or either go to the chat and put your questions into the chat or uh, wait for the final 10 minutes uh, group discussion uh, at the end. Um, but, uh, but Daniel, we thank you for coming in and for, for presenting that information uh, for us. And I agree, I think that, uh, that moving forward with these very inexpensive onboard processing will allow us to use these really slow data streams like Laura and others. That are coming up. So it uh, looks like Renee's queued up our next talk. Uh, so Felamon is going to give us an update on data provenance and registry. And I, I also want to comment on that issue of data provenance that not only, it, not only did Daniel mention it here, but there were some really good questions on the data management platform um, business going on in the chat as part of uh, what we should be offering in terms of workshops. So uh, so this should be uh, this should be play in line with that. Felman, if you're ready, it's all yours. Yes. Uh, all right. Thank you. Uh, it's nice to be here again, and nice to see some common faces after all those years. <clears throat> I'll be talking of something different from the previous speakers. Uh, I'll not be talking about chief sensors, but I'm, I'll be talking about a free service here. Uh, the idea is on the resolving data provenance with the OGC, uh, which is the uh, standards of development uh, group uh, using sensor ML and registry. Uh, and my co-author, Janet Frederick, used to be a very active member of this cluster. I think she's still enjoying her retirement it's somewhere in one of those mountains in Colorado. So I wish her the best. <laughs> Next, please. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> general idea of this presentation is that uh, every time I access data from some of these data repositories out there, I have no idea what sensors was used. Next slide, please. It's, uh, there, there, there had been in the most recent days uh, or recent months or even years, uh, the advent of metadata and the acceptance of metadata is quite important and it should come together with your data. However, as far as the sensors are concerned, there's very little is being, very little is being said about the sensors use in obtaining those data, whether they were manufactured in-house or in the laboratory or purchased outside, uh, they were poorly described. 
And um, there are very few exceptions out there that I can really put my fingers on. And even within the meta, current metadata standards that we have, uh, there is a failure in the uh, utilization of some standard schema. Very often, this is a free field that they, they, they used uh, to describe the sensor, and it can mean almost anything. On top of that, uh, there, uh, there seems to be a, a problem uh, in trying to identify sensors that are they're, they're named uh, in the same way. So I guess uh, I should say there's an absence of persistent identifier. Next, please. So in mid-2000, uh, NSF has funded an EarthCube initiative called the XDOMS, which is a cross-domain observational metadata for environmental sensing. The XDOM model will involve the, uh, involve the sensor manufacturers themselves, and for those who are creating the low cost sensors or homemade sensors or laboratory or school sensors, uh, you are considered a sensor manufacturer and you are involved in this particular model where you, you can then describe your very sensor. And it also will involve the, uh, those who are installing the sensor or, or operating the sensors themselves because there should all of the changes that are being made to the sensors or maintenance being made to the sensors needs to be journal. And it also includes the, uh, uh, the recommendation that a persistent identifier should be provided that actually describes those sensor properly. Next, please. So comes the, uh, the OGC sensor ML specification. Next, please. The OGC or the Open Geospatial Consortium sensor ML specification was introduced in 2004 as part of the sensor web enablement activities. And in early 2014, uh, OGC approved the publication of the next version of sensor ML that actually added a few more facilities and features that really will allow everybody to, uh, uh, that will allow the sensor manufacturers to really describe the sensors properly. Uh, these particular standards do allow people to describe their sensor things that measure or actuators and even processors. But learning how to use or encode sensor ML is, uh, it's not easy. Okay? It's, it's, uh, it, it requires a lot of reading, a lot of understanding on what this specification really is. Next, please. So the XDOMS project introduced a couple of utilities out there. And one of them is the ontology registry and repository, which was presented in one of the sessions earlier. Uh, an instance of which, and also created a, a viewer editor to allow you to edit using a, a very simple form uh, to describe your sensor. And lastly, it also introduced the, uh, the concept of a sensor ML registry and repository that I will be talking more about later on. Next, please. Now, as far as the sensor editor is concerned, since it is impossible for, or not really impossible, but rather difficult for you to encode the uh, sensor ML specs in, in XML or in JSON format or any other formats, uh, the, uh, the XDOM sensor ML editor is more like fill in the blank, so to speak. <coughs> now, there, are, there are several versions of the sensor ML editor and <coughs> Hold on. Oh, that was not COVID-19. <coughs> so, okay, uh, so we have the OEM description. This is usually being done by demand uh, sensor manufacturers themselves. That, uh, and then uh, this, <coughs> it also allow for the, this, uh, once you have deployed a particular sensor, you can create a new document again uh, that will allow you to uh, journal all the activities related to the deployment of the sensor. This will include the configuration that was uh, introduced or positioning or where the sensor is being positioned. And what is really important in all of these things is that it allows you to journal all the events when you deployed it, when the sensor was changed, when, when uh, things were changed uh, 
or, or, or updated or kernel updater or things like that. So you, you now have a place where you can actually journal the activity so that you, when you compare your, your data, uh, when you start analyzing or somebody analyzes your data, they will know why is it that there is a data gap here or there are some changes here, or there is some, a lot of errors in one area or two. Next, please. Well, well, it's nice if you can generate all these sensor ML files, but where do you actually put them so others can have access to it? So the sensor ML registry came about. Next, please. The sensor ML is a very simple uh, uh, system that after you have done your sensor ML, you can just, uh, uh, you can email that or you can submit that uh, document remotely and we can have that registered on this particular registry. As part of the registry process, a, a persistent identifier that follows a very simple asset identification standards. Uh, it's the URN standard that will allow you to, uh, that will be persistent throughout that describes your particular sensor. Now, uh, as far as the deployment is concerned, since you'll be changing this or updating the journals and things like that, uh, the document can also be versioned. So this is a very simple uh, application that uh, also provides, not only provides the, uh, uh, a path for a persistent identifier, but it also is a repository that, that will allow researchers to discover the sensors or sensor that they need for a certain thing. Next, please. Two minute warning. All right. Yeah, you can actually, uh, for, as far as the persistent identifier is concerned, where, well, it is quite easy. Uh, it is a, a HTML uh, standard. Next, please. Uh, the, uh, the registry, the registry is a JU code compliant. Uh, it is simply a JSON LD wrapped schema.org. Meaning to say that if you register your sensors uh, on the registry, it will become searchable through Google. So you just, uh, if you know the uh, Google data search facility, you can search it there and you'll notice that uh, all of these things actually leads to your uh, particular sensor ML file. Next, please. That's pretty much it. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's thank everyone. Uh, everyone, please thank uh, Palaman for his presentation. Um, great, you came in on time, and um, I think you you actually addressed a number of issues that have been going back and forth in the chat and uh, were hinted at in previous uh, uh, previous presentations. So um, fit right in. Let's right, good. yeah, good job. Let's uh, move on to our final speaker here of uh, of our session. So Steve Young. Um, formerly from the US EPA. So this is, this is somebody who's got a career in thinking about all of this stuff. And we're uh, very glad he was able to come in and uh, wind us up for the day. So Steve, are you there? I'm here. Okay. All Let's right, well, thanks for that here. intro, Scotty. And I, I should say I'm speaking only for myself here, uh, not for EPA, not for Innovate, the company I'm with right now. Next, please. So just a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm calling it Right to Know 2.0, and I will explain that. Um, so a bit of background. The original Toxics release inventory could be thought of as sort of like a 1.0 prototype. Again, I'll talk about that more. Uh, limitations that existed back in the 80s when that was you know, originally created, and the advances that we've seen to now and increasing a bit on a desired future state and some mostly technology focused recommendations. Next, please. So just kind of, you know, very quickly, um, some of you may be aware of the horrible tragedy in India in 1984 at Bhopal, where it, it was a chemical accident, a, a union carbide plant. So American owned, thousands of people died uh, many thousands more were seriously harmed. Um, and that kind of woke people up to the realization that chemical facilities could be really dangerous. Um, not only Bhopal 
type accidents, but people really didn't know what was in those facilities and what was coming out of those facilities. So the Environmental Planning and Community Right to Know Act of 1986 created something we call the Toxics Release Inventory, TRI. It began circa 1988, and it was kind of like a 1.0 prototype. Um, it, it, it hasn't changed that much since the early 90s in terms of its scope, its coverage, although there have been major improvements in the accessibility of the limited data that are in TRI. So TRI, it tells us a moderate amount about what I'd call a modest subset of pollution, but we don't know what we don't know, that old expression. Next, please. So if you go back to the mid 1980s and think about then versus now, you know, internet pretty much didn't exist yet. You had DARPA net, you know, it, it was coming, but it wasn't there as the internet we know now. There certainly was no web. There weren't smartphones. Uh, we didn't have ubiquitous computing and networking. Environmental monitoring was very expensive. And so that was very much on the mind of the policy makers who thought about what's actually feasible for a toxics release inventory. GIS was in its infancy. It was early days for remote sensing compared to where we are today. Uh, you only had early steps towards citizen science. No one had invented the term crowdsourcing yet. And AI, what? Um, versus now, you know, we, we have it all more or less, and it keeps getting better. We're seeing Moore's law um, majorly affecting the capabilities and costs of sensing. And, you know, we've heard about that from Martha and James and, and Daniel. Um, the tremendous advances in GIS, big data, remote sensing, on and on and on. So the world has changed tremendously in terms of what's feasible and potentially affordable compared to when TRI was created back when. Next, please. So what would be a desired future state? And I'm kind of trying to think about an ESIP audience here. I have to say that the idea of environmental right to know, um, it was very powerful and TRI had a lot of impact when it first came out. So um, it, it sort of showed that people care, they wanna know more about their environmental exposures. So in the future to empower faster progress to a clean world by using right to know information. I, look at our weather information today. And wouldn't it be nice if we had detailed information about environmental conditions and hazards as thorough as today's weather? information, which of course keeps getting better. Um, ideally, information that's reported by corporations would be seamlessly fused with remotely sensed data and data that are being generated out of academia, NGOs, and citizen scientists in general. So we'd get a complete picture of ambient air, water, and land pollution levels and the sources where possible with high temporal, spatial, and compositional resolution. And those data could enable tremendous advances in environmental epidemiology, um, relationships between pollution exposures and human health, concerns like asthma, um, uh, concerns like what Flint, Michigan surfaced about um, dangerous drinking water, and on and on. Next, please. So some recommendations focused primarily on technology. We're getting there, we need more, better and cheaper air, water and land pollution sensors. And it's so exciting to hear, you know, the kinds of things that we've already heard today. Um, this is one that maybe is a little novel, but um, we really need affordable, transportable, good quality devices that can detect and quantitate pollutants, including unknowns, uh, you know, where you don't know what you're looking for, you're looking for stuff that maybe shouldn't be there, uh, kind of like 
some of the work that USGS began to do with unexpected pharmaceuticals and household products showing up in water. Well, we need devices that can help with that. Um, quality concerns, uh, you know, any data that are coming from outside sources, they're going to be challenged and we need advances in being able to address that. I, again, touched on earlier this afternoon. I, obviously, more improvements in networking and power technologies, those sensors that could be deployed all over. Um, applying AI, the whole realm of big data, machine learning, et cetera, to look at rich pollutant and health data and develop new insights and set help set priorities for you know perhaps neglected problems um, neglected areas uh, neglected groups of people um, fusing data um, which i already touched on briefly and i, I view the ESIP community as potentially a, a huge source of help, you know, ideas, practical demonstrations. The, the thing that I guess is still standing out in my mind is this, are there some advanced ways to, uh, you know, back in the day, uh, GCMS's gas chromatograph mass spectrometers were over $100,000, and it was hard to measure even parts per million costs have come down, but could could we actually get to the point where we have some sort of a um, handheld uh, device <laughs> that uh, develops useful information, um, you know, it helps, helps identify where the problems are. So I am, next please, I'm going to stop there. This was a bit of a different kind of session, but I wanted to kind of maybe throw out some ideas. Um, I want to uh, say happy Bastille Day. I don't know if that was mentioned at the beginning of the session because I came in slightly late due to tech issues, but happy Bastille Day. And I want to thank all of my ESIP friends and colleagues for the many years of inspiration. And my contact information is here. The easiest one is frasmo at gmail.com. So thanks, and that's it. All right. Thank you, Steve. That was a great wrap up talk. Thank uh, everyone. Join me in thanking Steve. And we do have a question in the chat. Um, and you, you actually ended uh, early. Um, fusing citizen science data with remotely sensed data. Yes, we want this. Would help to defend pollution data if challenged, maybe. Um, so that's an interesting, interesting theory there. And, and, and certainly, I totally agree. And Karen, I think you were seeing where I was trying to go, that the, the more we're able to draw from rich, hopefully complementary sources of data, uh, the more powerful that will be. That there will be, I think, an understandable resistance from pollutant sources. Um, you know, on, on the one end of the spectrum, you have the companies that are trying really hard to be sustainable and, you know, to be greener and would potentially be very transparent about disclosure. But you've got some actors who don't want to be transparent. And if there's any data coming out that might make them look bad, you know they're going to challenge the data. Uh, so the, the more different sources that really build on each other and help make the compelling case that, no, there really is a problem here. Um, that, you know, that would be important. And I just want to mention one other thing that I forgot in my haste to come in under time, but um, the ability to quantitate um, substances um, could be so powerful for so many other research domains, you know, completely outside of the environmental realm, for example. Like if you're finding micro uh, levels of substances in the atmosphere, some of that's coming from space, right? That could be kind of cool for astronomers. Um, meteorology, uh, what's traveling around? Where is it coming from? So that there are some very exciting um, potential collateral benefits for all sorts of fields of research if we're able to start to measure more 
what substances are out there and you know what are their concentration levels and hopefully figure out where they're coming from. Well, good. All right, folks, we have um, officially six minutes left in our uh, session slot. And what we really wanted to see show up at the end here um, in chat or, uh, or otherwise are any, any perceptions that, that folks have, have now gotten or, or perhaps changed a little bit as a result of the session uh, regarding these issues of embedded analytics. So this is the, the micro analytics at the edge um, and data quality control or quality assurance um, associated with this. And this was, you know, that topic was raised a bit earlier, but I think it's still highly relevant, especially where Steve is talking about how do we aggregate community data, match that with sort of official data and tell a story or decode a story. Um, so, so now would be a good time if, if, if you want to raise a, an additional question. We have just a few more minutes before we're going to go ahead and close it out. Ethan says, processing at the edge has come down in cost. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really amazing. Um, I'm actually really encouraged by the, the amount of hardware that we could probably put together for workshops where we have most of the components need to actually ask and answer a science question like on the desk and we don't have to each make a $20,000 order from Campbell Scientific or something along those lines. Not that I don't love Campbell, I love Campbell. But. And, and I wanna emphasize the $30 is the very expensive, but no, 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 that gets you started. Uh, it's a, I can just say that uh, the processing at the edge adds $2 to a $3 microcontroller. So at five dollars, you're talking the ESP thirty yeah, thirty twos. I want to raise a topic for folks. Um, you know, this is a best practices group, and I'm pretty convinced that you know, as this explosion of IoT and cheap IoT continues to hammer all of our fields, that we do want to remain very cognizant of that that quality assurance, quality control sort of in C2 testing. So in Daniel's talk, he said, you know, we've got this weather station. It did all look like, you know, pretty high end gear on that tripod. Um, and many of us that run networks do the same thing where we, we have, we make the investments in core equipment that's tried and true. We know how it behaves over time. We know it's good points and, and bad points of a lot of different sensors. And we're able to test these new, these new methods and these, these new very inexpensive solutions um, alongside those. And I, I would just, I'd like to continue to throw that back at the community saying like best practice is, yeah, we can deploy, we can buy, learn and deploy all this stuff. But in the end, always include that, that bit of engineering testing with it in the publication, for example, um, and how you've attempted to put, you know, uh, differences in seasonal behaviors or differences in deployment behaviors um, between these between these devices. I think that's something that we, it's really our job as a best practices group to keep that kind of thinking at the forefront of the community. It, Scott, I wonder if I could put a, a plug yeah. for the GS here. Um, this is this is really a fantastic group. And I, and I want, it was really great to hear that Dynamics $30 is a lot, right? I, I, I love that. And I hope that um, it, it's just kind of this open invitation in a sense to talk to me, because I'm leading it, which is great, but also the survey, like James, we want to test your soil temperature sensor, right? And, you know, we have a lot of things coming up with the programmable gateway testing. One of them is checking out soil moisture sensors as a whole that you can buy off the shelf, right? The Campbell's 651s and such. Um, if, if you're open to it and, and the, the, the instrument and package is in a, in a spot, Let's you know. Let's start a discussion about testing it somewhere if that's something of interest, right? So, just just that aspect that if you need an environment to test in, connect with us because we cover a lot of environments and we are excited about testing. So, I just wanted to send that out there. And thank you so much for the opportunity. I, I really enjoy the the session. Oh, All right. I, I wanted to add that um, we have we could also test things here. We have um, cold weather testing facilities built in to Montana. So, you know, <laughs> if any of you have something you want to send out, we could test it. 
without waiting until that specific site opens up. That's just for the pattern ground and late line snowbanks. There are plenty of other places around. So, Renee, any uh, thoughts you want to wrap it up? I, I really enjoyed all of these presentations. Thank you so much to the presenters. Um, these were excellent talks. Thank you to all the participants. Uh, I know we lost a lot of people in the past few minutes, but um, yeah, thanks for bearing with us as we sort of navigated, forced to navigate this new virtual meeting format. Um, but yeah, and we, if, if you're not already on the mailing list and you're interested in these topics, please um, subscribe. Um, we're gonna have a follow-up to this session in our August telecon. Um, I think Dan Yall is gonna give a demo later this year that we'll schedule um, and maybe Steve as well. So um, yeah, I just, I, this was great. And thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much. Thank you one and all. We'll see you on the monthly calls and on the email list. Enjoy the sure. rest of the ESA meeting.